want to get to the word of God this morning and uh, we will be looking at the book of Nahum or Nahum. Now again depending on where you, you went to school, um, and Nahum is in the Old Testament. Um, he's one of the prophets that God calls to the nations other nations apart from the nation of Israel. And he calls Nahum to go to prophesy to the people of Assyria or the Assyrian Empire. Now, Nahum, it will be of interest to note that his name means or Nahum. Pastor Beatrice tells me Nahum. <laughs> so Nahum, his name means comforter. That's the meaning of the name Nahum. It means comforter. But this comforter, the message that he brings to the Assyrian Empire or the people who are in Nineveh is a message of doom and destruction. What a contrast. You know the people who are called Naomi? Naomi. Do we have Naomi or we have Naomi? So if... <laughs> Okay, Naomi's are here. Naomi are not here. Do you know somebody called Naomi? What does Naomi mean? Happiness, gladness. Have you seen a Naomi who wears a long face? Now this is it. Nahum. Nahum. Naham. His name means comfort, but he brings a message of doom and destruction to the people of Never. I want to give us a few verses that we might not be able to read, but you can uh, refer to them. Uh, if you're writing, you're going to write Psalms chapter, Psalm chapter number 103 and verse number 8. And it says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Nehemiah chapter number 9 and verse number 31 says, nevertheless, in the great masses, thou didst not make an end of them or uh, forsake them. And it talks about the graciousness of God and the mercifulness of God. Exodus 34, verse number, uh, number 6, you can write that. Psalm chapter number 86, verse number 5. For thou, O Lord, God at God and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on thee. Psalm 86, verse number 15. Psalm 145, verse number 8. Numbers 14, verse number 18. It says, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. And it continues on and on and on. Now, those verses and many others that you'll find in the Bible talk about the love of God and the way our God is slow to anger, but abounding in love and mercy and grace. Amen? Please, for your study, go and look at those verses. Now, this uh, book that we are looking at, the book of Nahum, like I said, he was called by God to go and prophesy, or to go and preach, or to go and take the message that God wanted him to take to uh, the people of Nineveh. And his message was that you are soon going to fall. This empire, the Assyrian Empire, is going to be taken over or run over by some other people. Because that's the way God used to bring judgment upon people those days. He would, he would raise a force that would overthrow the other force that was there. Because either they did what was wrong in the eyes of God, or God needed to punish them for something. And so, um, this prophet prophesies in the year 630 BC. And in the year 612 BC... Those are 18 years after. Six thirty BC plus thirty years, six twelve BC. So that calendar goes the other way. Are we together? So he prophesied in six thirty that they are going to fall, that God was going to bring judgment. And 18 years after, it's now 612, 
and Nineveh falls into the hands of the Medes and the Babylonians. It is not possible for us then to understand Nahum if we do not understand Nineveh. And for us then to understand Nineveh, then we have to go to a brother called Jonah. You know Jonah? Brother Jonah, the fisherman or the submarine guy. Now Jonah is called by God and he is told, go and prophesy or go and preach or go and take the message that I have given you to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah goes to them and the message that God gives Jonah is a message of repentance. As opposed to Nahum, Jonah is given a message of repentance. Go to the people of Nineveh, tell them to repent. Because if they don't, in 40 days, God is going to destroy them. And Jonah goes. And he preaches to the people in Nineveh. And the long and short is that they give their lives to Jesus or they turn away from their wicked ways. And they are saved. Or God remembers mercy and he does not destroy them. Now, for a moment, I know all of us have an idea about Jonah. You think Jonah is this kind of guy who God speaks in a loud voice and they do not obey. And so he is a bad brother. He is a good brother for the following reasons. And I pray that at the end of this, maybe you will consider repenting that you have judged Jonah all this time. God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. The people of Nineveh then, we have said, Nineveh had been taken by the Assyrians and it was the capital city of the Assyrians. It is recorded in history that Nineveh was so fortified that no enemy would enter Nineveh. The city of Nineveh was surrounded by a wall that was a hundred feet high. A hundred feet in Ikama, Nimbagan. Nikama. Hundred feet. It is a thirty three story building. That's what engineer is telling me. 33 meters. 33 story building is above KSCC. All right. Now, can we go to Nineveh? Chukua KSCC. You the Okuta, and Nineveh. KSCC is actually 28. And it is surrounded the city of Nineveh. That wall. Now, that wall was not just the 6 by 4 or 9 by 6 kind of a wall. It is recorded that the wall that surrounded Nineveh had a width that chariots of horses would ride, like 3 or 4. And so it was like thicker road, like thicker superhighway. You ask me how they did that those days and the technology that they needed, I don't know. But that's what is recorded. And all this they did because they wanted to be secure. The Assyrians wanted to be secure. They wanted to protect their people from uh, the enemies. As if that was not enough, inside the city of Nineveh, there were 1,200 towers where soldiers that were armed would be positioned as sentry guards and they would watch over the city and beyond to see if the enemies were approaching. And so they had the information, the intelligence, and SIS. 1,200 towers. All this is because they wanted to protect themselves. And they were protecting themselves because they wanted to be the empire that was so strong then and ruling. And this is a place that Jonah is sent to. And he is sent to go and tell them, repent. Now, the city of Nineveh, it is said that the, Roman, the, the Assyrian Empire was 
very nasty. They were a nasty lot of people. They would skin their enemies and then hang the skins of their enemies along the walls. So if they captured you as an enemy, they would skin you. Have you heard of these people who say, I'll skin you alive? That's a, an Assyrian mentality. So they would skin their enemies and hang their skins as decorations on their walls and cover their furniture. They would gorge out the eyes of their enemies. They would cut their noses. And they excelled in this area of, of persecuting and torturing people. If soldiers were caught or they were defeated or they were subdued, this is what the Assyrians would do. They were also known to kill children in the cities that they conquered. If they came and conquered a city, even the children they would kill. It is also recorded that when they captured the enemies, like they did to the children of Israel and the kingdom that went to the north, the ten, um, the ten tribes, they would take the people of Israel and with fish hooks, they would hook them on their tongues and then tie them together with a string and cause them to walk long distances in the wilderness and many of them would die in the wilderness. Now those were the Assyrians that were living in Nineveh. Those are the people that God tells brother Jonah go and speak to them that I am telling them to repent. And Jonah is a Hebrew. The people who are being persecuted are Hebrews. Hold on a moment there. Let me take you back to a couple of years when you and I rose against each other in this country. Christians and non-Christians alike. Our people. Didn't we say that? We caused others to flee from the estates, the regions that were perceived to be ours. Needless to say that some were killed, their houses burnt, their property destroyed in this country, not in Nineveh, here. And so before you judge Jonah being a Hebrew, just look back a few years. What you said, what you did, the messages that we sent, and these are the people that Jonah is sent to by God. Have we come to forgive Jonah? Are you saying, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, and Jonah is a saint? But at the end of the day, Jonah had to go because God sent him to go. And Jonah didn't want to go because of those reasons and maybe others. And so when he goes, he decides he's going to make distance between where God is sending him and where he wants to go. And so God sends him to Nineveh, but he decides to go to Tarshish. Tarshish was 2,500 miles away from where God was sending him. The dif a different direction. God was sending Jonah 500 miles from where he was. But he decides, yeah, I'm not going. Do you know those people? I am going to where I want to go. And let me ask, has God sent you anywhere and you have refused to go because of your perceptions, because you think you are not well able, because you don't like those people, because you don't like that family, or could it even be that he has sent you to your very own family and because of this thing that happened, you have not been able to forgive, you are saying, hmm, no, you don't know what they did to me. And so, those, those were the people that Jonah was sent to. So finally he gets into a submarine and this submarine had a way of swallowing people and vomiting them where God wanted and he's vomited at the shores of Nineveh. He preaches God's word and the whole city, if you give us Jonah chapter number 3 and verse number 5,
Jonah 3, was, Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 5. The people that, did, that Jonah didn't want uh, God to save or didn't want them to get saved because of what they had done to his own people. Says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. Can you imagine? <laughs> and proclaimed a fast. The same murderers, the same torturous people, they proclaim a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Verse number 6. Then what came to the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his important people, saying, Let neither man, nor beast, herd, nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. Verse number 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Verse number 9. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? And verse number 10 says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Now, if you hold on to that, and we go to the book of Nahum, chapter number 1, and verse number 3, this is what it says. Nahum, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and he will not, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Now mark the first, uh, the part A of, of this. Since the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Now, these are the same people that this guy, Nahum, is speaking to, telling them, doom and destruction is coming. Those are the people that we have seen and we have seen their way of life and how they treated people. And when they, they heard of the Lord and they heard what... Uh, the servant of the Lord was saying, they repented and God relented. Now, fast forward that, 150 years after, this is when Nahum is speaking to them. And he's coming to them because the same people that Jonah spoke to, they have now forgotten, they have gotten their own ways of doing things, and they have become a corrupt society, and God says, your end is coming. And indeed, when Nahum prophesied to them 18 years after imagine 150 years and then prophecy comes that this city will be destroyed and then 18 years grace period after that's when they fall the truth is we have a God who is slow to anger now how slow is God to anger he's slow like 150 plus 18 years that's how slow God is now, God is best at what he does. So if you think you are slow, God is so slow. But if you thought you are swift, God is swift to bless. So, Nahum comes and prophesies and the truth is the empire falls in 612 BC. In chapter 1 of this book, the first few verses of Nahum chapter 1, if you give us Nahum chapter 1, it tells us of the character of God. It tells us of the aspects, of the attributes of this God that we're talking about. And this is what it says. Verse number one. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision, this is what uh, the, the burden that uh, Nahum had. Verse number two. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. 
So if you thought you were jealous, God is jealous. The difference between the jealousness of God and your jealous heart is because you are jealous because you want what somebody else has. You are jealous because uh, you should have the best. You are jealous because you don't want the other person to succeed. Now God is jealous because he doesn't want to lose you. So, he avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. So when he comes to avenge, he is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. The enemies of God, the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. Number three says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. So, just hold it there. When we think the Lord is slow to anger, scriptures tell us that in his slowness to anger, he is powerful. He is slow to anger, but great in power. And says, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The wicked will not go scot free. Says the Lord has his way in the whirlwind. You know the whirlwind? Is called in other tongues. Yeah. What do you call it in your is Zengomas of <laughs> even then in the whirlwind, the Lord has his way. And, and and do you remember the whirlwind in the scriptures? And in the storm? Even in the storm, God has his way. It says the clouds are the dust of his feet. Now, God's dust is the clouds. No, your dust is the soil out there. God's dust is the clouds. This is a powerful, powerful God. He is high and lifted up. It says he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. And dries up all the rivers, including Jordan. The seas part and the children of Israel walk through. Now, again, just pause there. If you thought of the children of Israel coming from Egypt, as they go into the wilderness and they cross the sea, and for those people who went to Israel, please tell us, how big is that sea? It is huge. It is not me who is saying, it is those who went. It is not a fish pond. Now, when you think that he makes, he makes, uh, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. You know, when the children of Israel are walking through the sea, they are not walking on, on marshy ground, otherwise called matomboyas. Yeah, like you go getting stuck. No, on dry ground. And, and the children of Israel, numbered, their numbers were like three million people. The sea is told, please stop pathways, pile up this way and this way, make a way for three million people, and they should not get stuck in the mud. Their sheep, their, their flock, their children, their old men and women, all of them pass on dry ground. Now, that is the God who rebukes the sea and makes it dry. Verse number five. Since the mountains quake before him, the hills melt. And the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can deal the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. Now, from verse number 8 to the end of that chapter, which is verse number 15, from verse 8 to verse number 15, after talking about this God, then he brings out what is going to happen. 
the doom, the destruction that is going to happen to Nineveh. If you give us verse number 12 of uh, chapter number 1 of Nahum, verse 12 says, Thus says the Lord. Now, this is what God is saying about this city. Though they are safe, and likewise many yet in this manner, though they are safe because of their fortitude and their military power and all that, yet he says, in this manner, they will be cut down when he passes through. And this message goes to the, the, the people of God, the Israelites. Though I have afflicted you, he tells them, I will afflict you no more. Verse number 13. For now I will break off his yoke from you, tells the children of Israel, the yoke of the Assyrians, and burst your bounds apart. The bounds of Nineveh will be burst apart. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. You shall no longer be known. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave for you are vile. Verse number 15 says, Behold on the mountain, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace, O Judah. Keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Now that's God speaking. And that's what he says about that city, the Assyrians. What is this that we want to drive to? We're simply saying that in verse number 3, where we read of chapter number 1 of um, Nahum, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Now, God is slow to anger, meaning God, God never loses his temper. Have you met a man who has lost his temper? Or even a woman? And you're wondering, why did you lose it? Because you need it. You need to be tempered. And those of us in the house who lose our temper, Please, wherever you lost it, go for it. You need to be tempered. God never loses his temper. He is patient with the Ninevites for close to 150 years plus. That means he is a patient God. Now, the eternal truths that we would want to pick from this uh, uh, sharing, number one, when God is slow to anger, when God is patient, because that is his character, please, do not make a mistake to misjudge the patience of God to mean he does not care. His patience doesn't mean he doesn't care. Both to the avenge... To, both to the perpetrator of evil and to the one the evil is being done. When you're going through that tough time, God still cares. Now, you who perpetrates that evil, God cares. Don't you think that he doesn't care? He cares. So his patience, his slowness to anger doesn't mean that he doesn't care. Number two, God's patience is not inability to act. God's patience is not inability to act. God's patience is not impotence. God's patience is not, it's not like God has been overwhelmed by the situation. You know there are times we are overwhelmed by things and we become paralyzed, we don't know what to do. God never gets there. His character is that one of a patient, long-suffering, you know, abounding in grace and love. But it doesn't mean that he is overwhelmed. It doesn't mean that he's powerless. Number three, 
when God is patient, when God is slow to anger, when God has not dealt with our enemies, with the enemies of God, the way we thought he would, when God has not come for you or he has not come through for you in the situation that you find yourself in, please, it does not mean that he approves of the sin that is happening. When God has not punished me for sin, it doesn't mean that he approves of the sin that I've committed. It doesn't mean that he has approved of the sin that you have committed. It simply means this is his strength. He is slow to anger. And during this time when he is slow to anger, he is according us an opportunity, like the people of Nineveh, to get to a place where we can repent. And finally, let me say this. When the wrath of God sets in, and we just read, the seas will dry, the wrath of God set in in Egypt, and the seas dried. The mountains will quake, and people will not want to get close, because God is speaking, and the mountain is shaking. When the wrath of God breaks, or comes forth, nobody can stand before him. We read that in verse number 6 of chapter 1. Allow me to bring this to an end by saying, in the book of Psalm, chapter number 34 and verse number 19, this is what it says. Psalm 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him, that righteous man, out of them all, out of their afflictions. Now, that is scripture speaking to us that we have many afflictions. How much more are the afflictions of those who are not righteous? But in the affliction that you could be going through, some of the affliction that we are going through is sickness. sicknesses and diseases that are wasting our people, the people of God, people who are born again. Cancer is here with us. When you're going through those afflictions, it's not that God is unable to act. It's not that he is not caring. It's not that he is overwhelmed by the situation. That is his character. But those afflictions that are coming your way, God will deliver you out of them all. How he will do that, it is only him who knows. Our part is to run to that tower, that strong tower. Scripture says, when we run into it. Now, unfortunately, there are some of us who do not know that tower. So when afflictions come, you have nowhere to go. And some of our afflictions, and again, depending on where we are at in life, could be we have no rent. We have no school fees. We have become a laughing stock in the society. We've not been able to do this and the other. And they are saying, yet you believe in God. When your daughter became pregnant and they said, ah, and you are a, you are a believer, and they laugh at you. When your husband is a drunkard, and they laugh at you because you are a believer. You know a place to run to. The strong tower. And God is going to come through. And so I dare say this. And I, I say to myself. That caught up in that situation. And you don't know how to get out of it. Do you know the strong tower? And can we run to the strong tower? Because that's where our salvation is. Allow me to ask this question to all of us. As you bow your heads. Are you here this morning? And as we were sharing about these things, you could identify like the people of Nineveh who dwelt in sin, who did all sorts of cruelty and evil among God's people or against God's people and you find yourself there. You know you have not earned your living the way you ought to have. You know you have taken advantage of God's people. 
I very well know that there are people who have taken advantage of orphans. You are left to take charge over them, but the finances, the piece of land, the property that the parents had, you took advantage of them. Now, God is speaking to us. If we would repent, like the people of Nineveh, God is going to save us. If we don't, Nineveh fell. So destruction is coming. But because we have an opportunity, through this strong tower, we can run to him and we'll be saved. So if you're there, you have not known Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please, I'm asking, would you put up your hand? If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this would be a wonderful opportunity for you to know this strong tower so that during the time of affliction, doom and destruction, you have a place to run to. Are you there? Or maybe you're born again and you're saying, when you talked about living in sin, I find myself there. You can identify this. You can identify you've been corrupt. You've been all sorts of things. And this morning, you had an opportunity to hear what the Lord is saying. Please, if you put up your hand, we'll see it and we'll pray together. If you need prayer in this area, please put up your hand. We'll see it. We'll pray together. You're telling God, thank you for that hand. Keep it down. Anybody else? Anybody else? You're saying, I identify, I identify with this. Is there any other hand? This is your life. This is my life. You know you have not worked right. And as I speak to you, I speak to myself. There are areas in your life, there are areas you know that this is not right. We want to make it right. Please put up your hand. We'll see it. We'll pray together. Thank you for those hands. You can keep them down. Shall we pray together? Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you because we identify with the fact that you are God who is slow to anger and you are abounding in grace and love. We thank you that you would withstand the Ninevites for so long when they perpetrated all sorts of evil against your people. And when they called to you in prayer and in fasting, you heard them, you forgive them. This morning we ask that you'd forgive us. Yes, when we have found ourselves enmeshed in things, when we have found ourselves in deals that were not right, when we went and did things that did not please you, you're speaking to us. We ask that God, you who is full of grace and mercy, you who is abounding in love, that you would forgive us this day. And as it were, that you become that strong tower for us, that when destruction comes, we will have a place of refuge. We will run to you, strong and mighty tower, and that we'll be saved. I want to thank you for your people. Thank you for each one of us that has identified an area in our lives. And we need you to come through for us. We pray that in the name of Jesus. That we shall not mistake. We shall not take it for granted. That when you've been slow to anger. That you have been inactive and overwhelmed. And that you didn't have the strength to do it. We pray that we will be able to see the love of God. That you have given us all this time for us to come back to you. We thank you and we honor you. We pray that our Father and our Lord, though we could be facing afflictions, that every one of them, every one of those afflictions that your people could be facing this morning, because your word promises that you would deliver the righteous from all their afflictions, that you will do so in your own way, in the name of the Lord. And so we thank you. So we declare every affliction upon your people. You're coming through for us. You're coming through for us. You're coming through for us. For those that are sick, you're coming through for us in the name of Jesus. For those that do not have finances and we are cornered, 
they are even about to auction us. We are coming to you for those afflictions. Our Father, we are asking, deliver us in the name of Jesus. Oh yes, for the wayward husbands and wives, our Father, and children who are lost in drugs, our Father, we ask that you would come through for us in the name of the Lord. May it please you to do it so speedily. Because you are swift to bless, you are swift to love and to forgive. We thank you this morning because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.